Wonderful food served on the grandest tables is so much more than just a meal. Historically, these extravagant dishes were created to represent power. They also set fashions. Nowadays, royal food is all about showcasing the best of British. In celebration of royal food, we know it's the Queen's recipe because we've got it in our own hand. From the present and the past. That is proper regal. We recreate old family favourites. Now, the Queen Mother had this really wicked trick with these. What a yep. mess. We sample royal eating al fresco. Oh, wow. That yeah. is what you want. And revisit the most extravagant times. Pheasant, stag, turkey, salmon, oysters and turbot dressed in a lobster champagne sauce. Unbelievable! This is Royal Recipes. Hello, I'm Michael Burke and welcome to Royal Recipes. This is Audley End, one of Britain's finest stately homes. Built in the style of a royal palace and once owned by a king. In the splendour of the gardens, halls and kitchen of this grandest of country houses, we'll be recreating the food served at the highest royal tables. And it all starts here with this gem, a royal kitchen maid's cookbook, the only surviving recipe book of its kind in the royal archive. This is an exact copy of the original, which is kept at Windsor Castle. Inside, the recipes of Mildred Nichols, who worked at Buckingham Palace in the early 1900s. And for the first time in over a hundred years, we'll be bringing these recipes back to life. This time, we cook food that reflects the royal family's love of the countryside. Right, so... Today, in the Royal Recipes kitchen, Chef Anna Ha tries sausage making using the Queen's favourite meat, pheasant. You might be lucky to get a cocktail sausage. It's quite a process <laughs> and quite an art, I think. Lord Ivor shows Dr Matt Green the rich history of a shooting estate created by a Maharaja and adored by royalty. Said George there. That's right, King George and the Queen. Wow. And we follow Prince Charles's example and go foraging for mushrooms. Hmm. That's worth picking. In the kitchen wing of this glorious stately home, we start our celebration of the royal's country pursuits with a recipe from the early days of the Queen's reign and a firm favourite with the Queen Mother. Hello and welcome to the Grand Kitchen. With me, Anna Hoare, top chef at a London restaurant where the young royals go. Yes, they do from time to time. <laughs> Down the ages, most of our kings and queens mm. have been country lovers. And when it comes to eating, they're really fond of game. What are you going to do for us today? Well, I don't blame them. I love game myself. Mm. And today I'm actually going to make a royal recipe. Mm. This is a recipe from the Queen Mother's Cook mm -hmm. and it's galantine of game. Galantine? Galantine. So galantine usually would be like a kind of sausage shape kind of um, type of terrine. It's cylindrical rather than Yes, but square. today I'm going to keep it with the traditional terrine mould mm -hmm. just because it's easier to kind of shape it. Um, so I've lightly cooked off uh, pheasant and partridge breasts here mm -hmm. and then the legs I've just kind of pulsed it in a blender while they were raw the, then. And I'm going to mix it with a little bit of sausage meat and then pack it in nice and tightly. Wow. So first of all I'm just going to give these uh, a bit of a slice. You want to kind of cut them about a centimetre thick yeah. so that we can nicely line it up on top. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're still slightly warm, these are. I'm sure you can smell them. There's a lovely kind of, like a mild, them. yes, go on, get in there. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm. Yeah. It's lovely yeah. game, isn't it? But if, you, if you're not a fan of game, this Could actually, you do it with chicken? Yeah, originally this would have been done with chicken. Mm. But, I mean, when you live in uh, a country like the UK, this is some of the best game in the world mm -hmm. in this country and it's a I think it's a great shame that once it's in season that we don't kind of avail of it um, but yes if you wanted to use chicken you could or actually it's very good for using a little bit of leftovers as well so if you had like your roast kind of chicken mm -hmm. you could do that with a little bit of um, sausage meat and you could pack it in okay so I'm going to start is, this is a royal recipe no chicken here this is a royal recipe mm -hmm. that's exactly right okay so I'm going to mix the two meats here together mm -hmm. It's pretty simple, um, but you just want to make sure that it's completely combined. Um, Tell I've, me, why the sausage meat? Um, the sausage meat is a good kind of filler, and the flavour of the, the pork meat is very nice. Then we're going to wrap it in bacon as well, so it kind of all gels in very nicely together. So just give it a good mix so that it's nice and evenly kind of 
distributed. The sausage meat that I have is from a, a local butcher. Mm -hmm. It's already kind of seasoned. Mm -hmm. so, um, and it's a bit fattier, obviously, than the is. game, isn't it? Actually, you're right. There's a good fat content um, mm. in the sausage meat, which gives a good richness to the galantine. In the olden days, would they, have, would they have wrapped it in bacon like that? They may not have, no, mm. actually. They, they probably would have just had this in a cylindrical mould, mm -hmm. so it looks like a, a large sausage. And then they would have sliced it and set it in gelatine or aspic, or mm. possibly set the entire one in aspic as well. If They, they, were were, they slice absolutely it loved later. aspic, didn't they? They did love aspic, and I, and I think that because we don't use it anymore, it seems kind of bizarre to us, but it was a, a method of how you preserved it, because it, it stopped the oxygen getting into the meat. Ah, it was a pres more than yes, else. yes. I like the taste of it. Why has it gone out of fashion? Uh, I don't know because I don't like the taste of it. So uh, <laughs> maybe it's us cooks that have uh, yeah, yeah. signed its death warrant. There's a little bit more in there. Okay. And then. Oh, you're yeah, sticking a layer of the yeah. of the of the breast in yeah. at that stage. Yeah. yeah. The rules are in a lots of pheasants to play with, weren't they? Were so mm. fond of hunting and shooting and fishing and everything. Yep, yep. In fact, I think Edward VII bought Sandringham in Norfolk, you know, one of the royal households, uh, for its shooting, principally for its shooting. And the estate is actually laid out as a shooting estate. But you could imagine that, though, waking up in the morning, mm. going out with your, your, your team of friends and, and, and shooting the game, yeah. bringing it back into a kitchen like this yeah, and yeah. creating recipes like this. I, I just think it's wonderful. I really do. And I think it's a great shame that sometimes recipes like this are just kind of not as popular as they should be because once you've made this, this is going to last you days. Yeah. And traditionally, this is eaten cold. You know, this would be a, a kind of cold larder starter. Mm -hmm. And I just think, although it takes a little bit of time to make, there's an awful lot of satisfaction to recipes like this. And you don't really have to be a royal, do you? I mean, the, the pheasants and partridges and things are in the, in the season. Absolutely. Uh, are, are pretty widely available. Absolutely, yeah. I would completely agree. Are they expensive? I mean, everything's all relative, mm. but no, I would not say it's a, an exceptionally uh, expensive meat. Um, it wouldn't be any more expensive than duck. Mm. Mm. It's a kind of vegetarian's look away now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael, would you reckon that you'd give this a go? I think I could do this. Yeah? But Are I think, you a game I, think I'm a, I think I'm an undiscovered cooking talent, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take the credit of that. So when you make your first cookery book, you've you done want that to brilliantly. dedicate it to me? That actually works. Right to the last spoonful. Well, my was that just your that's innate just, skill? Just my skill. <laughs> that's all it comes down to. So I'm going to pack this in lovely yeah. and tightly to make sure that I don't have any little air pockets. Yeah. And essentially, that is all the hard work almost done. I'm just going to close it up. Now, oh, look, you left a bit of pheasant. Yes, just for you. A little snack. Mm. Keep those energy levels up. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fold this over like this. And then a few more slices, just to make sure that there's no bits of mince peeking You sure out. it's going to stay sealed? Yes. Yeah, no, it will. It'll all kind of cook together. I think I should be able to fold them over now. Yeah. Oh, it does look very neat, doesn't it? Yeah. And wait till you see it when I turn it out. Mm -hmm. It's super neat. And you could understand, actually, why they would set it in the kind of gelatine or the aspic when you, when you see this turned out. OK. OK, so... All I'm going to do now is wrap it in some tin foil. Give it a good kind of squeeze all around. And then I'm just going to cook it in a, a tray of hot water. And this just helps with the kind of even cooking of right. the of the terrine. So you need to cook this for about an hour and a half at about 160 degrees. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to give my hands a quick wash because I've been handling raw meat. And I'm just about to reveal how our terrine is going to look, or our galantine's going to look. Aha. Oh, I love this oh, bit. Yes. Can I do the uh, yes, reveal? Yes, please. One, two, three. <gasps> <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? It's lovely, isn't it? It's beautiful. But what are, what are the shiny bits down, yeah, the, that's, down the side? Yeah, that is the natural kind of gelatine yeah. that has come out of the, the it's meat. It's own aspic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Ooh. Yep. Yeah, can turn it round a bit there. Ooh. Can I put the plate there? Yes. Oh! Oh, look at that. Yeah. Wouldn't that be lovely, just sitting around a table with your friends, a cheeky glass of red? Oh, well, one or two, a supper, maybe. A supper for a royal. And you'd take it cold, like this? Yes. A, yeah. yeah. Traditionally, galantine would have been served uh, cold, and ballantine 
which is almost the same idea, but that would be served hot. Now, how do we eat this? Do we have it on toast? Uh, on toast, toast, maybe with a little bit of fig chutney could fig be quite chutney. nice. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think something with a little bit of kind of sweetness, acidity and a bit of spice goes yeah. so well with game. Have a knife and fork. Thank you. Right. <laughs> it's fantastic. I'm going to go from this end. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, yes, it's quite solid. Yeah. Here we go. Mmm. Mmm. Mm. 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 The chutney goes so well with it that. It does. You kind of need a bit of the chutney mm. with it. Oh, it, yes. Uh, but the, although it is game, it's not mm. overpowering game. No. I don't think mm. it's the scariest game in the world to make it's, a, it's a galantine with. Mm. Oh, the Queen Mum's cook knew what she was doing. <laughs> a delicious and simple way for the royals to enjoy the game shot for their table. Shooting parties have always been part of royal life. Many a grand shooting estate was created specifically to attract that patronage. Elverdon in Suffolk is one such estate. Its current owner is the fourth Earl of Ivor, Edward Guinness. Good morning. Good morning. He's agreed to share its past with historian Dr Matt Green. This is fantastic. This is our van. This van has been with us since 1934. Since 1934? It's what the shooting guns have wow. always been driven around in. A suitably vintage start to the day. The Guinness family have owned the 17,000 acre estate since 1894, but Elverdon was a firm favourite of the royals even before then. It was Queen Victoria's close friend, the Punjabi Maharaja Duleep Singh, who bought it some 30 years earlier and set about building its hunting reputation. With Duleep Singh, Elverdon became one of the finest shoots in the country. Apparently, one day, he, he killed 760 game birds with 1,000 shots. With 1,000 shots? That's it's... almost a 100% success rate was considered extremely good. One of the top ten shots of his day. Are you that good? Uh, forever, if it wasn't a challenge, it wouldn't be fun. <laughs> the game birds are safe with me. OK. Elverdon was the perfect place for the Maharaja to entertain his neighbour, the Prince of Wales, who owned the 7,000-acre Sandringham estate just across the county border in Norfolk. And it was a whole kind of social occasion. They had some delicious food and drink. Yeah. And, um... Julie Singh got so large, he needed to be seated while shooting on a oh, really? on a wicker chair, right. which rotated so that he could face the game birds from whichever direction they came from. So he could swivel around and then he, have a shot. He, he was a sitting gun. Edward VII, George V and George VI all shot here at Elverdon, and no shooting party was complete without lunch. So, so where are we? Over this way, yeah. this wood here is mm. the Duke of York wood. Shoots would stop off and eat, enjoy their lunch. And they would, um, you know, have the most amazing array of food, which uh, was all laid out in a marquee. Over here? Oh, and, in a marquee? Yes. Really? It's amazing to kind of picture that, isn't it? Because the Prince of Wales himself would have been out there after a successful morning, then this, almost by magic, this marquee would appear and they'd be in there having this lavish banquet, exchanging excitable tales, quaffing down fine wines and then going back out there. Must have been amazing. And, and if only the trees could talk, all right, the stories yeah, yeah. and the wonderful tales that were told. There's plenty to tell from Lord Ivor's family archive. It includes detailed records of those lunches and the illustrious guests. Come in, Matt. Thank you. This is my great-great-grandmother's book. It's a photograph album that mm. she took with her and uh, many of her guests uh, signed. And she put in some beautiful photographs mm. and she... Oh, wow, these are really old. And so this is essentially a collection of photographs of the shoot. And what about this picture here, talking of lunch? Are these the kind of pop-up dining halls that uh, they used to have their meals in in the middle of the shoot. Where they were, they were dining at the Duke of York Wood. Wow. Um, so the trees have grown, but mm. the place is the same. And what are these signatures? So they're all the house guests. OK. So George there, was that the... That's right, King George. That was the king. And um, the queen and... 
Here we go. Churchill. And there's even a picture of Edward VII himself. It's amazing to see these. It was a, a really vivid trip down memory lane. That's, That's right. Not at all. A oh, great pleasure. Shooting parties are still a part of life today on some royal estates. Apparently, Anna, pheasants are the Queen's very favourite game bird, which is probably a good job because they shoot an awful lot, <laughs> lot of them, especially over Christmas. Boxing Day is apparently the big shooting day, and Prince Philip used to, I think his doctor advised him not to, used to be shooting these birds, and the Queen was involved in uh, picking them up, apparently, or at least collecting them. Just imagine the two of them there as a couple out, kind of, doing such a, a traditional British hobby. And Prince Philip likes cooking, I think. Yeah, I heard he, he did like to cook, and also when they would uh, shoot the pheasant, mm. any of the leftovers he would bring to the local butcher, and they would make pheasant sausages. Didn't want to see anything wasted. Exactly. And, and are you going to do those pheasant sausages? I'm going to make pheasant sausages, but I've never made them before. <laughs> so uh, I'm following this, this, this old pheasant recipe for sausages, and I'm going to give it a go. So okay. um, fingers crossed that I make edible sausages. So what have you got there? Right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I have um, some sausage meat, some uh, chopped up streaky bacon, and minced pheasant. Because pheasant isn't the obvious thing to have in a sausage, is it? No. Because there's very little fat on it. No, very little fat, but I think there's a good flavour to lend very well. Mm -hmm. If you match it up with the kind of fattiness of your, your mm -hmm. sausage meat and your, your bacon, I think it's going to go really well. And then I'm just going to put like a little hint of spice in there as well mm -hmm. to give it a bit more interest. So okay. um, let's get going. So I'm going to stick them all it's in. A smoky bacon. Yes, yeah, just to give it a little extra bit of flavour. Mm -hmm. You're going to mix them all together? Mix them all together, actually, and I'll just pop the spice in there now. What spices are they? So, um, a pinch of nutmeg, mm -hmm. and then another pinch of allspice. And I'm just mixing it in here with the sausage meat, the chopped bacon, and then the minced pheasant. Mm -hmm. um, and just give it a good mix. And then I'm going to use a kind of sausage attachment on a, <laughs> sausage. On, on a, um, a home mixer. This is the bit I'm dying to see. Yes, I well, I mean, I'm dying to see if I can make You're these. You're not, uh, you don't make sausages as a general rule? No, I mean, I would do boudins and I would do um, different, you know, sausage shapes, but not actual traditional sausages, which I think is, is great. Like, I'm quite interested to see how this is going to go. I'm quite nervous, I'm quite nervous. <laughs> Should I hold it? Yes, make okay, sure it right, move. so... The recipe says I need to spoon it in there, mm -hmm. put a little bit extra on the side, switch this little bad boy on. And let's get sausage making. Can you push it all down like that? Yeah. Slow process. Yeah. Hope you've got no plans for the <laughs> afternoon. Ooh. Keeps... And you've got the sausage skins already on the end there. Do you want me to do that? Should yeah, I, should that I press would be that great. down? Yeah, if you okay. keep spooning. I will. I don't know how hungry you are, uh, <laughs> Michael, but you might be a, lucky to get a cocktail sauce. It's quite a process today. and quite an art, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Now, that's a proper looking sausage. It's not as easy as it looks, this, you know. I mean, oh. we could keep going all day with this. We could, we could. Should I put a bit more in? No, definitely not. That's let's, it. let's nip this in the bud. Let's switch it off. Yeah. Phew. Oof. Okay, a little tie. That's quite good. With your help there, Michael, I was able to... I think that was the crucial element, actually. Yes, absolutely. Now, now I've got to twist them into sausages. Okay, right. so I think we should get three out of here. Yeah. If I do that like that. Yeah. And then just, just give, give them a it twist. a twist. Oh. Twist. OK, pheasant sausages, three pheasant sausages there. I'm they, quite proud of that. They do look good, actually, don't they? Yeah. So the next step is to fry your sausages in a pan. A mm -hmm. little bit of butter, a little bit of garlic and thyme. Mm -hmm. Goes delicious with some uh, mashed potato. And this is a... Mashed potato, of course. Of course, yeah. bangers and mash. Uh, but this is a, a cider gravy, so you've got chicken stock, a very little bit of flour, caramelised onion in here. And a little secret to this is a spoonful of English mustard. <sighs> Yeah. So you've got the sharpness of the cider, mm. and you've also got the, the hint of mustard, just yeah. to take off the fattiness of the sausage. Yeah. And then maybe just a little pinch of brown sugar in there as well, just to give it a bit of sweetness. Just give that a nice little stir. 
They probably needed recipes for leftovers because, you know, so many pheasants get shot on these, uh, on these mm. occasions. King Edward was so keen on shooting that he had the clocks advanced by half an hour at Sandringham so he could spend more of the day shooting. What do you think of that? They used to call it Sandringham time. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I love your mash. Yeah. Creamy. What's the secret with that? Uh, being Irish, I think. What, you're good with potatoes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes, okay. yes. Now that is what I call a sausage. Oh. And you put them on top of that. Uh, that's your chefy bit, isn't it? That's my chefy bit, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my pizzazz. <laughs> Okay, yep. and now our lovely gravy. It's very traditional. Would you would you serve it with any other vegetables? No. No, I think just like this mm -hmm. is, is, is exactly what you want. Yeah. Yeah. On a cold winter's day. Exactly. So there you have it. Pheasant sausage, cider gravy, and creamy mash. Yes, please. Bring it on. A knife and fork for you, a knife and fork for me. Go on, go on, you made them. Oh yes. oh, yes. They're chunky, aren't they? Yeah. And that mash. Mm. Look at it, like silk. Cider gravy. Here we go. Mmm. Mm. I've never had pheasant sausage before. Brilliant. And I certainly will have it again. Mm. It's delicious. It's absolutely delicious. Mm. These posh sausages would be a favourite with all ages after an afternoon in the countryside. For the royal family, rural pursuits mean different things to different people. Prince Charles is passionate about natural food, and he's not averse to foraging for his supper. When it comes to mushrooms, John Wright is an expert, a self-taught mycologist. And like Prince Charles, he's very happy to forage. I've been mushrooming a very long time now. 1965, I think I started. I get just as excited now as I did when I first started. I just can't, I can't wait to see what we're going to find today. Mushroom foraging can be traced back to the Roman times, but it's not until recently that it's become such a popular pastime. People absolutely love it, and it sort, of, it sort of calms the nerves and slows the heart rate. I remember seeing a picture of Prince Charles in the paper carrying a, a mushroom basket. I thought, that's, that's great, you know, because he, he's got people that could go and pick mushrooms for him, but he wanted to do it himself, because that's the whole point of it. You go, actually do it yourself. He's engaging with nature, really. And with over 15,000 species of mushrooms in the UK, there's plenty to choose from and the royal estates lend themselves particularly well to foraging. I think Prince Charles is quite, quite a lucky mushroom hunter because he's got access to this wonderful parkland of the most of the royal estates. So uh, uh, he, he could just go wandering and find grassland species and woodland species kind of in his own back garden. Not everybody can do that. One of the greatest uh, places for fungi, I'm not sure if you can pick there anymore, that's Windsor Great Park. I have, must say, I have been picking there in the past. And there you have these uh, mature trees, these veteran trees, and they've, uh, they've had time to establish relationships with lots of fungi. Foraging for mushrooms takes great skill and knowledge and should only be undertaken by experts such as John, who often forages on his friend's land. Grasslands like this are a great source of mushrooms, as they have often been left uncultivated for hundreds of years, creating an undisturbed environment for the fungi. Many of the more dangerous varieties, such as the death cap and destroying angel, won't be found here as they grow in woodland. This is lovely, it's one of my favorites. It's a, it's a really common mushroom and uh, that's quite a nice size. They, you often get them in quite large rings. It's called the scarlet wax cap. It's quite a good one for uh, frightening, frightening your friends when they come around for dinner. People are really worried about red things, and I can understand why, but uh, you now there's some edible red things and there's some poisonous red things. You just have to know what it is. These are nice, but quite amazing. Um, these are puff balls. It's quite tasty, and you can see how tasty it is because somebody's eaten a bit of it already. There's been a slug in there. There's a little bit left. Try and get away from the slug nibbled area. A mm. bit like a, yeah, sort of a mushroom flavoured marshmallow. That's worth picking. In the basket. Ah, ah, look at this. 
Wow. <laughs> John finds a ring of parasol mushrooms, the final ingredients needed for a well-known royal favourite dish. Now he just needs to find a spot to cook. They say that food always tastes better outdoors, and it certainly does. And nothing better than mushrooms you've picked half an hour ago. These are super fresh. We have heat. My goodness, I think I just sit here and warm my hands. But in, in honour of the very fine mushrooms I've managed to pick today, I'm going to use the Duke of Edinburgh's own recipe for wild mushrooms, which is mushrooms a la creme. So let's get that melted. What I think I'll do is I'll put some uh, of our wax caps in first. They take a little bit longer to cook. They're quite moist. Remove the twigs. I don't worry too much about that. That's a little uh, a scarlet wax cap. Just get the stem off. And now our magnificent tough one. Break him in bits. Pop him in. What else we got? Uh, here's my parasols next. These, uh, these cook very quickly. Just going to pull the stem out. You can't do anything with the stem. And don't need to clean it. Don't need to wash it. Just break it into little triangles and, and in it goes. Uh, mushrooms really do need salt. They, uh, there's a very bland flavour. They need that little bit of salt. I'm uh, going to put a little bit of pepper. These mushrooms are cooked. I'm going to put this in. I think that's enough. I do like the cream thick, but not too thick. You don't want it to be like uh, sticky custard or something. You just need it a little bit runny. That's it, done. Let's try it now. Let's have a go. Uh, it should be perfect. And the cream would have taken on the flavour of the mushroom. Um, my God, that's amazing. It's really, really brilliant. Right, now for some of the mushrooms. I'm going to go with the uh, puffball. Actually, it's sort of ice cream. It really is. It's just wonderful. But it's so much better out of doors. But really, this is the, the perfect end to a foraging day. Pick something in the wild, we eat it. The royal family's love of the outdoors has always meant a willingness to try something new. Here in the Grand Library of the House, I'm with Fiona Ross, who's a food historian and writes a lot about the royals. Most of the royals really adore country pursuits, don't they? But Prince Philip, I mean, he's 90-odd now, but uh, certainly for most of his life has been a real enthusiast for the outdoors. Yes, he has. Uh, when he first met the Queen, he used to go jogging with four sweaters on. You know, he loved exercising so much. And then he's always been... Um, he's, he, in later years, he became very interested in playing polo. Um, and the Queen gave him his first polo horse in 1951. Uh, uh, he was very resistant to the idea at first. He said it was what it points about on the horses. <laughs> and he also said it was a snob sport. But he ended up being amongst the top 2% of polo riders in Britain. Really? And shooting? Fishing? Shooting, fishing, yes, absolutely. He was taught to shoot by the Queen's father. And when he first turned up for a shoot with the Queen's father, he had no gear, nothing whatsoever. George fitted him out with everything. And subsequently, he's... Um, shot snipe in, in Sandringham or Keeper Cayley and Grouse in Scotland and Balmoral. He loves to clean and gut the creatures himself and then he flogs them off to the local butcher <laughs> called H.M. Sheraton in Ballater who sells them on. He's a bit of a practical joker too on these kind of things. Yes, yeah, he can have a lovely sense of humour. When uh, the Queen was rather upset during the tour of Canada in 1951 he, because her father was so ill, he decided to cheer her up by offering her imitation bread rolls, which squeaked when she bit into them. He also offered her mixed nuts from a tin, and when she opened it, a, a snake flew out. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, practical joking seems to run in the royal family, doesn't it? The Queen Mother was a, a famous practical joker, as well as being an outdoors woman. Yes, yeah, she was. Um, she loved anything that, that made people laugh. She was absolutely adorable. Um, she loved fishing and was very amused once when uh, another lady spotted her fishing in the River Dee and tried to curtsy, thus filling her waders with water. <laughs> <laughs> but her picnics were famous. Yes, she loved having picnics, as all the Windsors did. Um, what she loved most of all is her equerry recalled that she liked something fishy, like a moose to start with, and that would be followed possibly by some cold game caught the day before and finished with jam tarts, which she would cut the head off of and fill with cream. All in the great outdoors, which in her case was the far north of Scotland, so she must have been pretty hardy. She was very hardy, yeah. She was hardy enough to survive one of Prince Charles's meals. Prince Charles <laughs> invited her to his bothy for a venison stew, and uh, they sort of chewed their way through the venison stew, and then when she was driving back with her equerry, she said to him, 
Are you feeling a bit hungry? <laughs> and he said, no, I'm fine. She said, well, I'm hungry. Let's go make some scrambled eggs, <laughs> which they did. <laughs> Fiona, thanks very much. Thank you. Country life for the royals nowadays is also about the enjoyment of growing and eating their own produce. And one of the most prized fruits that they grow is the Windsor white peach. And royal chef Darren McGrady has a recipe that really shows the fruit off. In the grounds of Windsor Castle, they grow the best peaches in the world. Beautiful white peaches. And they really are the culinary crown jewels. Unfortunately, I don't have those gorgeous peaches they have at Windsor, but I've got some nice ripe ones here. Darren is making peach princess, a dish he's cooked many times in his 15 years service. To make this royal favourite, these peaches are left to soften for five minutes in water with some sugar and cinnamon sticks. While the peaches are cooking, we're going to make the mousse. And the mousse is really retro 1970s, but it tastes fantastic. And when peaches were in season, this is a dish that the Queen would have maybe twice a week. So we start off by boiling some milk. We then need to put some eggs and sugar together and we need to separate the eggs so we want the egg whites to whisk into the mousse but the yolks go in with the sugar and then a little vanilla in there too this is mixed together then the boiled milk is added and once it's all mixed in we go back to the pan when the mixture has the consistency of cream, it's time to add some dissolved gelatine to help it thicken. Pour into that. Keep whisking as you pour, because we don't want lumps of gelatine in there. The mixture is then cooled in the fridge for 30 minutes. While the mix is, is just cooling down slightly, the peaches should be ready now. And we can lift those out to a plate. I'm really serious when I talk about the peaches being the crown jewels, the culinary crown jewels. Well, when the peaches were in season, they traveled to wherever Her Majesty was. And if she was at Balmoral Castle, there were wooden boxes made, and the peaches were actually taken from the trees, wrapped in cotton wool, and packed neatly into the boxes, and then driven to Balmoral. Once the egg mixture has chilled, it's time to whip some cream. Nice soft peaks on the cream. And the egg whites. I whip the egg whites until they're nice and stiff. How do you know when they're ready? They need to be really, really stiff. So much so that if you tip the bowl up over your head, it doesn't fall into your hair. Then we start off with the cream and add all of our cream into the egg mixture. Then we can add the egg whites and just fold these in, cut and fold, cut and fold, turn in the bowl. So once it's all mixed in together, then we're gonna pour it into our beautiful dishes. This part needs to go in the refrigerator just to set up. And I've got one in here that's been setting for a while. Oh yes, this one's set up perfectly. This is just what we're looking for. Nice and firm on the top. It's ready for the peaches. The next stage is to peel our peaches, take that skin off, and then we'll just cut some little slices, lay them on the top, and then cover them with the jelly. And they just lay neatly on top. And finally, all we have to do is put our jelly over the top. Darren has already prepared a sachet of citrus jelly to complete this dish. And I'm just going to spoon this over the top of those peaches. And that's the most gorgeous peach princess. A timeless classic worthy of its regal title.
peach of a dish, would you say? Ah, oh, good one, good one. <laughs> Look, when our kitchen maid, Mildred Nichols, who's left us this fantastic recipe book, was working in the Buckingham Palace kitchens, Edward VII was on the throne, then his son George V, both dedicated countrymen, out and about all the time, shooting, fishing, in Edward's case, philandering. <laughs> so what have you managed to find in uh, Mildred's cookbook that is a nice snack to take out on your country pursuit, something to put in the hamper, something to have in your hand, a nice sweet snack? Okay, well, this recipe is very interesting. It's called Chapeau Commune, and it's like a... Chapeau Commune. Yeah, um, I've never seen anything like it before, so I'm quite excited to see how it's going to turn out. It's a kind of pastry that uh, is wrapped around marzipan, and then we're going to dip it in chocolate. That originally wasn't in the recipe, but I think it would be a nice kind of twist on it. But I think what makes this recipe so interesting is that the pastry is like a mixture between kind of like a pastry and a bit of a cake because you've got a bit of baking powder in here, a little bit of cream, butter, flour. Yeah, it is. It's, it's quite interesting. So you just mix all those ingredients together and you roll it out to about half centimetre thick. And that's what we have here. Chapeau is French for hat, isn't it? That's right, yes. And you shape it into a particular kind of hat, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Exactly. Okay, exactly. So, so what do you do? I'm just going to cut the rounds out now and then I'm going to make the marzipan. I love marzipan. Yeah, yeah. And I think the royals were fans of, of marzipan. Oh, down the ages. I think it would ages. have been seen as a real treat because there was a lot that you could do with marzipan. You could colour it and shape it. And I think back in the Tudors' time, they used to like it shaped as little animals. Oh, and they'd have them on the banqueting table yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Biting their heads off. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, it must have been for the, only for the very, very rich in those oh, days. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so this is your almond flour, and it's the base of the marzipan. It is just ground down uh, almonds. Um, and I'm going to add the sugar. Is marzipan always with almonds, or could you do it with other nuts? Oh, you could do it with any nuts. I mean, I walnut Traditionally marzipan. It's almond. Traditionally, it's almond, but walnut marzipan was my favourite. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to add our butter to it. And then the same way you would make like an apple crumble, mm -hmm. you'd just kind of try to lift the butter, mix the butter through your almond flour as quickly as possible. And this way you get kind of like an even covering of uh, butter on your almond. So then when you add your egg, it just kind of all mixes together like a, like a good dough. I got the impression of slightly sniffy about marzipan, as if it's a sort of old-fashioned taste. Yeah, you I know, do. When I said I love marzipan, you know, yeah, somebody your age probably would. You know? That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> oh, Ralph, oh thank my you God, very much. Michael, it's like you can read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is fairly transparent. Yeah. Well, my my dad loves a bit of marzipan, and I remember as a kid, like when Dad would be all excited about the, you know, the sweets you'd get at Christmas. Mm. That would, and I, as a kid, you know, they looked amazing. You're like, oh, beautiful. You'd sink your teeth into them, and you'd be like. Mm. Not a lot going on here for me. But the Queen loves uh, loves marzipan, apparently. And other people know that. I think that when she went to Germany once, they actually gave her a big marzipan uh, rendering of the Brandenburg Gate. Can you That's imagine? That's brilliant. <laughs> you can just imagine her sinking her teeth into that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've been trying to do some research and, uh, and, and find out a bit more yeah, about it, yeah. having found it in Mildred's book. Yeah. But, but there isn't very much about it. But chapeau commune mm. rather sounds... It means a kind of a kind of revolutionary hat yeah. from the t you know, and it seems a rather odd thing for the royal family to have in that sort of way, doesn't um, it? Wait till you see. Like when these bake, they will look a little bit like Napoleon's hat. Oh yeah. wow! Okay, what next? So all you need to do is crack one egg into the center. Mm -hmm. Keep a sharp eye out for any eggshell looking good to go. Just give it a mix. Mm -hmm. Now, if the almond meal that you have is a bit dry, a little tiny teaspoon of water or anything like that would kind of be enough. Just to, to moisten of, it. Just to bring it together. Because you don't want your marzipan to be too dry. You don't want it to kind of crumble. You do want to be able to kind of sink your teeth into it. Ugh, I'm not a marzipan fan, <laughs> even saying that. But that's, the, I know, the way it should be. OK, so it looks like it's almost together now. So I'm going to get my hand back in there, a bit more pressure on it. OK, so when you're rolling marzipan, you don't use flour because this is a flourless recipe. Uh, we're going to use uh, icing sugar to help you roll it out. So um, we're going to roll this into small little balls. I'm just going to take a little bit of icing sugar there. It's the fact that it's, that it's in tiny little pieces, tiny little hats that make it so suitable, don't it, for yeah. putting in the hamper, for almost putting it in your pocket. If exactly, you're exactly. So you just oh, no, no, and this is the tricky bit. Yep, yep, nice yep, you roll the balls. balls. Yeah. Yep. Very neat, very round. <laughs> Is the size important? Yeah, well, I think you want to be able to have a good amount of the marzipan in there. I think it's the star of the show. You mm. know? 
what well, sink through the pastry and into the sweetness of the marzipan. Exactly. So now I'm going to start shaping the little hats. Mm -hmm. We're looking for a three-point hat. Oh, it would be called a, in those days a tricorn hat, wasn't it? A tricorn it? hat. I don't know why they went out of fashion. They look rather elegant, I think. Not sure Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a very big head. <laughs> seven and seven eighths, you know. Mm. There we go. Oh, they look rather oh, sweet. Don't, don't they? they look quite they pretty? Do. Yeah. They do look quite pretty. So I'm just going to pop these on the tray now mm -hmm. and I'm going to egg wash them. It gives them a nice kind of glaze and shine. And then I'm going to bake them in the oven for about 10, 12 minutes at 180 degrees. And then when they come out, just to give it an extra kick, a little bit more sweetness, I'm going to glaze them with a sugar syrup, which is just water and sugar boiled together. It's going to be a really kind of sweet little mouthful, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, a nice crunchy and soft kind of uh, biscuit. So I've actually baked some earlier on, which I'm going to bring over now. Look at these. They do look lovely, don't they? But but they, they've lost some of the hat shape. Yeah, right? it's a, it's a, well, it's a different hat shape. But yeah, I can kind of see Well, it's see a kind of squashed hat yeah. shape. <laughs> so um, these ones I did glaze with mm -hmm. a, a sugar syrup on top. And you can see how shiny and delicious yeah. they look. And what I'm surprised about is that the pastry is quite firm. Just oh, I thought yeah. the pastry was going to be um, soft. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to now dip them in the chocolate. Now, Mildred wouldn't have done this. No, this she is, wouldn't This have is done your this. twist. This is my twist. Oh, Maybe, just the bottom? Yeah. Maybe to hide the marzipan flavour is why I'm, <laughs> I'm dipping it in chocolate now. A spoil sport. So. You don't think you're almost literally over-egging the pudding? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got chocolate and marzipan oh. and this lovely pastry. Yeah. With the butter and cream in the pastry. Oh my goodness, that sounds amazing. <laughs> when you describe it that way, everything the way you describe things sounds yeah, amazing. Yeah, I'm slobbering a bit myself, I have to say. <laughs> this does look good. But when you put that chocolate on there, isn't that going to leave the grid? You put it on the grid there, isn't well, that going to leave a grid pattern? You pattern can't on? see it. And what it does is that if there is a little bit of excess chocolate, if I've been a bit sloppy in my dipping, oh, surely it not. means it will drip off. Oh. It does look good, doesn't it? <laughs> so it's really important that when you melt your chocolate, you do it over a bain-marie. And mm. what this does is that it gives it a, a slower and a more even um, temperature to the whole bowl so it doesn't burn. Because chocolate's quite sensitive. You use those bain-marie quite often, don't I you? Do. I do. Honestly, I don't know what I do without a bain-marie. I think these are the two prettiest ones, or them. So mm. go for the... Go for the Quasimodos. Yeah. Uh, we should wait, shouldn't we, for, for the chocolate to set, but I don't think I can. Mm. Okay. Can I try it? Go on. I really hope you like this. Oh my goodness, that looks delicious. Can I do it in one? No. Mm. Mm. Now, I'm not a marzipan fan, so I, I don't know how I'm going to feel about this, but I do think the chocolate is going to help. Mm -hmm. It's a chunky little mouthful mm. of sweetness, isn't it? Mm. Oh. I love marzipan. Mm. Mm. The crunch Takes is me back to my childhood. We could only ever afford it at Christmas, but we absolutely loved it. Mm. Oh, I think Mildred's onto a winner here. I think hats off to Mildred. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for our program on food for royal country pursuits. See you next time. Mm. <laughs>